Hello. Thank you so much. Lovely to see everyone uh, bright and early, early-ish. Uh, on this day, and thank you so much. We got a we got a relatively short panel here, um, only thirty minutes, so we're going to have to uh, jump straight to it to make sure we get a chance to to cover everything. Uh, for those who don't know, my name's Hazel Savage. I'm the VP of Music Intelligence at SoundCloud, and I'm going to throw to the panelists to introduce themselves. So we'll do we'll do names, jobs, where you work, and if you if you feel so obliged, your uh, your elevator pitch, as we uh, used to call it. So uh, Andrew, we'll start with you, and we'll go down the line. Hi, I'm Andrew Beatty. I'm the co-CEO of BeatDap. We help fight fraud by identifying all the bad actors, malicious streaming, and sort of uh, stream manipulation. So we work with a lot of distributors, uh, you know, streaming services like DSPs, and help them uh, find all the bad actors and, and then reallocate money back to real artists. Uh, John Masopoulos, you heard about me, but we are a client of BeatDap, so we're, we're, we're a big fan. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, you heard about me, CEO of Napster. Thanks. Hi, um, Iqbal Amir. I've uh, been in live entertainment for about 12 years. Um, currently the founder and CEO of All Access Anonymous. We are building a hyper-engagement tool for live entertainment fans and event organizers. Hi, um, my name is Ken Chung. Uh, I'm the vice chair of Our Song, a venture-backed uh, startup that I uh, co-found with uh, Chris Lin, who found uh, KKBox, which is the world's first streaming services just two years before Spotify, uh, and also John Legend, the uh, singer and songwriter. Uh, and what we do is basically it is we are building uh, uh, what we call the world's first uh, open license uh, community where you can, I mean, digital creators can freely create, use, explore, collaborate, remix, you know, song of one another and then also get paid uh, in this digital age. Okay, so we've really we've really got the full gamut here of experience and also different ways that new Web three technologies uh, can be can be used. So in the in the panel description um, that that you've all come along to see, there was elements talking about the disruption of these technologies in the industry uh, as it pertains to music ownership, distribution, live events, and and that kind of artist to fan connection. Everyone up on the stage does does something slightly different. Um, so I thought I'd just start with uh, with my kind of first question is, is well, the question is, how is your company embracing NFT technology? However, I would kind of expand that and go, if you want to talk more about decentralized Web3, um, as well as NFTs, uh, feel free, but also kind of weave into your, uh, to our understanding, the, t the different types of technology, because we kind of just bundle everything under under one bracket these yeah. days but I think there's a there's an education piece and then a little bit about your company so we'll start back and come back so Ken if I'll uh, I'll throw this one sure to you. Um, so I mean I have like about five years of experience in social media um, I believe particularly when it comes to music social media sparks the remix revolution I mean people remix with one another song music labels promoting new singles allowing people to remix the songs again but there's no money there nobody get paid you know from from doing those you might get a lot of likes comments reactions but nobody get paid uh, needless to say you know the creators and also the original uh, song owners um, however i mean at the same time as we all have seen there are growing numbers of uh, musicians i think Numbers could be in the tens of millions of musicians out there, and they are churning 120,000 songs every day, right? Um, and then, however, when you look at the convention copyright structure and who get paid, it has not been changed for many, many years. So if you want to, like for example, if you don't know someone in the music industry, if you just want to collaborate cross-borderly with someone, it's almost impossible. You need to connect with someone. I mean, to be honest, in the music industry, a lot of people are still using email to connect with one another in order to collaborate. For example, I'm sitting in Singapore. I want to collaborate with someone in Los Angeles. I may need to email someone. Oh, do you know that person who owned that song? Are you sure that he really owned the full right of that song? Like he might only own 30% or 70%. So this has been complicated for many, many years. So we know that it is a tough problem. But um, I mean, at our song, we are trying to tackle these problems. In fact, we envision a world where musicians can freely 
co-create and remix with one another and work with one another and get paid at the end of the day. And we'll, it will spark a new remix revolutions. Lovely. Thank you so much, Ken. And Iqbal, what about, uh, what about in your line of work? Yeah, um, I mean, that's really nice and, and positive. I think mine is a bit more dark. <gasps> okay, well, uh, prepare yourselves, <laughs> yeah. everyone. Um, I think live entertainment um, has a big problem. Um, basically, uh, it's extremely difficult to monetize. Uh, it's you're going you're going into um, you're paying you're playing Russian roulette basically when you're going you're paying exorbitant fees for artists and venues and productions and the event organizer inherently takes all the risk and sometimes they win most of the time they lose you know um, so I believe that NFT technology can help that uh, because I think we can deepen our engagement with the fans the true fans and we can get them to support the event organizers to de-risk their business model and uh, that's what AAA is doing so. So is it yeah. is it really um, the NFT is the ticketing solution or is an upsell? Yeah, no. So the NFT is not the ticketing solution. I mean, a lot of companies are doing that. I they, thought I'd heard of that. Yeah. Um, what we're doing is we're using NFT technology to basically track wallet behavior of the real fans. So who are the fans that are actually promoting your event? Who are the fans actually recommending other people to come? Who are coming early? Uh, who's buying uh, food and drink and merch? Uh, and, and, and basically, we're allowing them to collect points. And with those points, they can redeem money can buy experiences, VIP upgrades, backstage passes, autograph merch, that kind of stuff. Um, so we think that this is one way for event organizers to de-risk their business model and work with true fans that can help them uh, uh, basically sustain themselves and hopefully make money. Um, but yeah. But, Got it. Uh, so, okay. so the NFT technology is in the center of that entire piece. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and John, I know we did just hear from you um, up on the stage, but of course, on the off chance someone's recording this and just streaming it solo, uh, if you could, if you could give, it for, give us the information again, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, I, I think I changed direction. So on the live side, um, I think the other insight in the music industry is that live has been unnecessarily separated from streaming and radio. So they're all unnecessarily separate. And if you refocus the business on fans, uh, a fan, you know, maybe drives to the to the event, listening to radio, goes to the event, experiences the event live, and then maybe goes back home and listens to, you know, to a streaming service. It's all the same fan, but they've had these bifurcated experiences. So we're we're really excited about live. Um, we're working on some partnerships with some venues where we see, again, love what you're doing at the venues, either for the venue operator or for the artist. Right, depends on which which side you please, but the notion of being able to know that you're a fan of, I'll use Blonde again, pimping, pimping Blonde Shell. So if you're a fan of Blonde Shell, you go and see them, um, go and see them live, or Fontaine's, just Arctic Monkeys, which I unfortunately missed in Nashville anyway. Um, so if you go to the show, we already know that you're a fan because you stream them. And then when you, when you go to the show, maybe you're interested in, in connecting with the, the band like after the show, right? So what's the after experience? a lot of the stuff at Roblox with these virtual concerts. So how can I extend the experience maybe before or after the, the show and have some kind of collectible to cement the experience with the fans? So it's, it's starting to connect from, from social media to live events, to streaming, to having all these experiences centered around the fan and rewarding you know, the behavior of the, of the artist to hopefully encourage more, um, more behavior and, and um. more revenue. I'm feeling a very holistic approach as we as as we come down the line towards here, uh, Andrew, to to take us home with uh, with BTAP. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about how these new technologies are being, how you're utilizing them? So in truth, we aren't really util utilizing them. Okay, uh, well, give us a fresh we, take. We, <laughs> yeah, too honest, I guess. Uh, I think the reason I'm mostly up here, I started mining Bitcoin in 2011. I've invested in hundreds of, of top projects, top gaming projects like Splinterlands, uh, metaverse building companies like Land Vault and uh, previously Admix, um, dozens of tokens like the Mist and Lab stuff that just came out. We at BDAP started as a blockchain solution, so we have 30 patents and high throughput blockchain processing. Uh, we started with the question of how many times is a song played. Uh, we wanted to know like the authenticity and the real count so that there was no discrepancies in any of the audit or reporting. And what we found along the way were these streaming behaviors that were um, not right, like users that were streaming 30,000 times in a week or users that only had 10 streams but mimicked hundreds of thousands of other users. Uh, and so that would be evident of like a large bot farm. So we started realizing that the number of times a stream count like occurred was irrelevant if you didn't know why they were occurring and how you could solve the fraud. So we actually started as a blockchain company. It's why it says BeatDAP. It's a beat distributed application. 
And then we moved towards fraud over the years and have now become the sort of um, leader in fraud detection for this space. But my background is 10 plus years in blockchain and kind of been around the block a few times. So I think where I see it, circling yeah. back, is the utility aspects. I, I really don't like, um, I've been kind of the vocal uh, one saying, don't do NFTs for royalties. Um, I have like obviously being on the royalty end, I'm like, who's tracking that? No one I know ever gets paid. It's it's really bad that leaves your fans holding the bag. I haven't seen very many, there's some, but I haven't seen very many like trusted parties really put the fan first in that format. And so I'm more excited about how NFTs can be used as a utility for access, for uh, special experiences, for deepening that relationship directly with the fan. Because when I think about music as a kid, I remember switching schools a lot as a military kid. And I remember going in one of my schools, you had to do this presentation of like who you are as a person. And one of those things was your favorite album. And I remember bringing Nirvana and Sublime. And that was like such a statement of my identity of who I was at the time. And as a kid, especially before you're the age 25 and that's your world, music is such a large piece of who you are and who your identity is and who you connect with. And I think that that's like truly, if you look at the users of NFTs and who the super fans typically are, it's those people figuring themselves out who are deeply connected with that fan and, or that, uh, that artist. And I think that that's where I think these utilities and where the NFT components can go. And that's what I'm excited for. Love it. So Love it. if I can add one thing, so I 100% agree. And I, I think we can't leave the panel without sharing our first concert. I'll, I'll go, mine was Genesis uh, at Wembley Stadium. Um, so uh, I think that social aspect is key, but also from a minting perspective, we bought mint songs that one of the leaders in the in the kind of NFT minting space, similar to what sound is, is doing now. So we have that technology in house. And I think the, the NFT um, versus like the metaverse, um, what we call Virch, uh, economy to parallel the two. So like with Little Nas X, we had millions and millions of fans paying low ticket amounts, a um, dollar, three dollars, five dollars for, for different digital goods that had utility to them. It was around self-expression. So we think low ticket items in terms of fandom where it doesn't, it's not labeled as an NFT. It's just, oh, I like, you know, whatever, Sad Night Dynamite, another plug. Um, and they've done something that I would like to have as a fan that's not generally available. I might pay a couple of bucks if it's easy to, to do. I think that's possible. I think the earning um, of these digital goods through behavior, like around engagement, whether I'm like a, a good fan, I go and see all their shows, or I've listened to all their albums, or I've like promoted them. So I think it's earned and low ticket amount. Uh, and then obviously to your point, I think access as well, that unlocks these, these uh, money can't buy experiences as well, either virtually or, or physically. Yeah, I, sorry. Oh no! Oh, so, Iqbal yeah, and yeah, tru you. truly resonate with that. Um, we actually did our first POC at a music festival in Vietnam, eight thousand people, uh, uh, and we opened it up. Uh, we we call our NFT a totem, so we so it doesn't has that NFT connotation <laughs> because we're not fans. Oh scam, you know. So we did it for five hundred people. We had an engagement rate of eighty nine percent, and what's interesting, we had a guy who spent. I I, I don't know what the dong is, but basically five hundred dollars just so that he could meet and greet an artist backstage. And he didn't even win. You know, he, he yeah, yeah. So he, because he was a, like a raffle, the promoter wanted to make it a raffle to see how many people would, would spend the money. But then now we know that this guy is a super fan of that artist, right? And then now the promoter can, or the next time he's doing that show, he can go on the blockchain, see the wallet behavior, and then remarket it specifically to this guy. And I think that's amazing. And I really hope they sent him a T-shirt or something at no, the very least. They could, maybe they will send him a, an airdrop him a digital something. A airdrop right? him something. And, and Ken, sorry, you had to I, take. I, I think when we when we first started, you know, the company, um, it was like an NFT marketplace for everyone, right? So back then, uh, people see people saw NFT more of like for speculative investments, buy low, sell high. Uh, over time, we have also tried like fan engagement tools, like ticketings, all that. Uh, but it come to a point that like when we pivot to the current model, more of like a B2B model, we realized that almost all the musicians, like thousands of musicians that we've spoken with, most of them like were hesitating to associate their name with NFTs these days. Is it a scam? Is it like what, what exactly it is? So that's why... I think for us, we now position NFT more as like a behind the scene technology that really help you to unlock the economic potential, but more as a, what we call like a preload license token than anything, like really like focusing on the utility itself rather than the technology or like the, the name of like NFTs. 
I, I completely hear you as well. You know, it's that boom and bust, isn't it? People get really excited about a technology. AI is kind of hot right now. And then, you know, it can a few people can get burnt. Not, a, not everyone's a winner. So, okay, so I've learned we've got Andrew up here as an old school Bitcoin investor. Um, and I absolutely loved how you talked about initially you thought you were just counting the streams and you uncovered a bigger problem in that not every stream is equal. So super fascinating. I feel like we've got the whole spread. We're, we're heading down the, the way of utilities uh, for NFTs. Um, so also I thought since we're in Singapore, I live in the UK now, but I did live in Singapore for six years. Um, I wanted to maybe starting with you at, at the end, Ken, and coming back, what do you think the benefits or the bonuses are of, of being in Southeast Asia? Why is this market important? I think obviously it's the populations, right? And the young populations in this part of the world. And I do believe that a lot of them are growing up like the Gen Z's, the millennials. They are growing up in this, what we call like the remix, you know, generations. And this generation like to collaborate, like to co-create, like to remix with one another. I think like this technology empower people to work with one another in a much easier way. I mean, like on our products, basically we see creators, say for example, in Singapore, works with musicians in the US, in Europe, in Africa, I think which we have not seen in the past. Mm, absolutely. Iqbal, how's the, how's the live market here? Mm, so uh, I, mean, I, I, I run a music festival out of a cruise ship in Singapore called It's the Ship. Like it's the, it's the shit, but it's the ship. And uh, along the way, uh, you can see a lot of support from, uh, from Singapore. But also I've built my relationships with a lot of live event organizers, you know. So when I go out with uh, AAA, I, I, I get immediate, an immediate feedback loop of what their problems are, try and solve it. And today we've signed 53 music festivals, independent music festivals to come and use the solution. So Singapore has played a massive role in that because we are, we're all friends. Let me put it that way. We're not like uh, extremely competitive like the States. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. Nice to hear. Uh, John. Well, Owen, what was your first concert? Sorry? What was your first ever concert? Um, actually, my, my first live concert that I went for was actually Incubus. There you go. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Cooler than Genesis. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think Southie, I started my career here again, as I mentioned before, um, working in Hong Kong and Tokyo and Singapore and, and Beijing. And so I love the region. Um, I think a lot of the innovation we have um, at Napster Carrier Partners, we do a lot of work with SFR and, and Telefonica, who are all around the world, and some new carriers we're rolling out, who have big presence in, in Asia. So I think the, the notion of the market out here, it's the focus for the music industry in general, because the developed markets are somewhat fully penet pen penetrated. So the emerging market opportunity with India, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, um, eventually someone will, will conquer China, um, I think is massive. And I think the, the, again, the young people and the openness to new business models to test out here, we're definitely considering Asia for some of the things I was talking about in the last, the last chat where um, there already is an openness. So the things you're mentioning, remix culture, and again, the, 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 the super social apps out here are, are started here and now are coming um, crazy Elon, you know, with, with X. Is that, so they're, they're coming later to the West. So I think that the openness for... Uh, a lot of the business models and, and the, the innovation, I think, is already here. Co the culture is like a lot of young people collected, and they're not on a traditional service or a traditional model. So I think it's a, it's a very fertile uh, region for innovation. Great take, love it. And Andrew, I'm I'm excited to see Beat up here at at, uh, at Music Matters. All that matters. What 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 matters to you? Wow. So I was trying not to do a really bad pun. Then I said I'd said the word matters too many times. Uh, so yeah. So what how, what did you think was was the focus of, of bringing a beat app to, to Singapore? Well, we, we come out here almost every year anyway. Um, we work with a lot of um, Asian partners. Uh, we've been coming out here probably since 2018, 19. So putting a lot of effort here. When we came out and met with partners originally, I said, look, like I realize there's a lot of tourists here, but we're here to, to stay. So we're gonna make an effort to come here uh, and show our face and, and really be part of the community here. Uh, not just uh, sort of come once a year for a, a, con a conference and leave. And so we spend a lot of time in Asia. We spend a lot of time trying to make our partners feel um, that we value them. For me, within, with NFTs and blockchain in general, like there's no denying that uh, Asia has been a massive market for NFTs. Like when I think about all the gaming projects I've invested in, all the top players, all the guilds, all the you know, like first adopters, early adopters tend to be from, from Asia. Um, it's just like a very, um, like they're early to adopt, early to take risks, 
Um, and you just learn a lot in the process, you know, like yeah. I learned how to lose a lot of money in NFTs, uh, but, <laughs> uh, but it's been fun, you know, and I think that all of those learning experiences have helped all of us probably make better products that are more geared for fans. And, and just like in marketing, you can't take the same marketing message to every market. I think yeah. the same thing applies to communities. You can't build an NFT community that's a one size fits all for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I think deeply understanding the market here is critical to being successful. Yeah, and I think also just from a general, because we're a, we're a music service, the uh, the rise of Asian, I mean, 88 Rising um, and others, but the, the popularity of Asian music in general on the global scene is is undeniable. So uh, I think it's super important for anyone to spend time out here because you know the music is coming from here that's being listened to in the West. So. Yep, absolutely. I've I've said this before, which is you know SoundCloud might have 340 million songs, but you know if uh, if QQ have 100 million songs uh, sung in Mandarin, I bet you we don't have them. So uh, so it's a it's a really sort of different part of the world as well. Ken. So I I want to like. Uh share like a recent example, like a campaign that we recently did with a Grammy winning uh, musicians called Kimbra. Um, I mean, she's coming from New Zealand, but spending most of her time in the US. Um, and that campaign's winner is actually a remixer from Taiwan, you know, a musician from Taiwan. So that's, that's what I mean by like now that if you can freely collaborate with anyone, you know, on the platforms, you know, that will spark a lot more creativity, uh, collective creativity. Absolutely love it. Big Kimbra fan as well. Great. Love to hear that example. I was going to throw one more thing in. I think there's this idea that I really love about uh, NFTs being earned and not purchased. Um, what I think is really interesting about NFTs is their representation of your identity. And I think a lot of adults miss that uh, in terms of like who you are as a person. And what I learned with working with fan groups over the years is fans are fans of fans not just the artist themselves. You have a deep sense of community with the other person who loves that artist just as much as you do. And many times you're just as excited to meet and engage with that other fan as you are the artist themselves. And I think earning that right to say, I'm part of this tribe or this part of this group is, is really an interesting, deep, connective component to where NFTs could go that I think everyone misses because they just try to buy an NFT. Yeah. And I think there's something really cool about earning that thing that you can look at somebody else and say, like, you could have only gotten that if you did these things with me. Got it. Got it. Iqbal, were you going to sort of, is this something that you exemplify on your platform? Yeah. All like, about it, the, exactly. how do they earn it? A hundred percent. Um, that Incubus concert I was telling you about. Yeah. I met, I met a friend who is, who is now my best friend there. You know, and we we both went because of the concert, but then we realized and we became fans of, of each other and, and, and we catch up all the time and we, we're great friends, right? And in All Access Anonymous in AAA, um, we do that. It's earning. You can't buy it. So you have to, you, you, you earn your stripes and then with that, you can, then you are allowed to redeem the experience, you know, and, uh, and yeah. Love it, John. No, no, I, had, I mean, uh, I call it the interest graph. So I had, I had a bunch of startups before going to Roblox around this one was called Tastemates. And you could you could share, we used the Tinder swipe to catalog all your interests in music and movies and TV and games and books and travel. And the uh, and people started using it for dating, uh, but also for friendship. And I think it's always, when we had a we had a compatibility algorithm, actually at Napster, we, we um, actually have the, the, the same pattern filing um, around this uh, human connection around around uh, overlapping taste. So I think it's, it's a huge manifester of, uh, of how we get on and it's lost in the, in the current graphs that we have. We have kind of work graph with LinkedIn and we have, you know, I know Iqbal has a, a puppy or whatever on Instagram, but like, I think the, the overlap you of, you do, have, I have a puppy too. <laughs> so uh, I think the overlap of um, music taste is again, very defining, but all other these, these other interest areas as well have yet to be harnessed. So again, it's that notion of community, you know, we call them collectives that, that I think will form and, uh, and think about, and also everyone likes to politely flex, right? So if I happen to have discovered an artist early, um, wouldn't it be nice to have an NFT to your point that kind of proves it and I get the top 100 fan badge. So imagine my profile, uh, like kind of lighting up with all my top 100 fan badges. Um, that's cool. Then I start checking out other people check out my profile. They go, oh, I like that band too, or, or whatever. And that, and that is the catalyst, I think, for these collectives to congeal. Um, and then hopefully you discover more music, you're going to see more shows together and, and, and the industry starts to grow again. 
I love it. I love it. Okay, so I mean, it's the quickest half an hour of, of my life so far. It's uh, I feel like we could we could keep talking, and and I think you know we we were never going to get to all the questions, but hopefully anyone who's in the audience can come up and, and speak to us afterwards if they have follow up questions. But I was gonna I was gonna end on a really fun question where I was gonna ask you all if you could have any like dream NFT, what would you have? But I've just learned from the four of you that you know money doesn't talk, and it's not just about going and buying the thing you want to buy. So I'm going to reformat my question and it's still going to be about like, what's the dream thing you could have, but maybe it's, you don't, you don't come at it from the money or from the, the physical owning. It's about how the technology has brought this innovation. So, so kind of Ken, where do you see us going? And if you could have kind of one thing, what would, what would that be? I think as we have discussed, I mean, like technology wise, I think like, um, is it has been evolving really fast, uh, but not the adoptions. You know, we've been talking about blockchains for quite a number of years, NFT for the last two, three years. But as, as you mentioned, all of a sudden, like AI have really like override, you know, everything, right? I think it really comes down to whether there's some real applications and utilities, whether you are really solving from real world problems or creating new one, you know? So that's why we are really focusing on like solving the conventional copyright problems uh, in our company. And everyone should check out the Our Song website. It's absolutely fantastic. I was I was on there yesterday, so highly recommend. Iqbal, what's that dream NFT? Okay. Um, so the why why, why let me let me just uh, try and rephrase something. Why sure. why 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 I'm why we are doing triple A is because um, I think that there is a big problem with live entertainment. I think that there are huge entertainment conglomerates which are monopolizing this industry. And because of that, live events or concerts or music festivals are slowly losing their soul because they have to, they can't take those big risks anymore. And these big entertainment conglomerates can do that. So AAA is to take back that ownership. It's to work with independent organizers, it's to share the profits, it's to own the network together. And that really drives me to make this happen. And, that's the uh, dream. Yes, that's the dream. I love it. I love it. And John, would it be a, a Genesis NFT for the old first concert? Would that be would that be a, a desirable item? I do. I do. I, I do. Um, that would be fun. Second one was Rolling Stones. Maybe more Rolling Stones <laughs> than Genesis. Um, I think. Yeah. I mean, it, one fun one would definitely. I worked in the music industry for a long time. Would be every single show I'd been to NFT. Um, if someone could somehow remember that or redo it, that would be lovely. I could not remember every show I'd been to. So th if that tech existed, that would be phenomenal. Yeah, to go back some. But no, I, I, I think in general, the the exciting part, again, is the um, the notion of ownership and, and kind of community and rewards and, and kind, of, kind of belonging, whether you want to call them NFTs or these rewards. Um, and finally, making music, again, this, this community where um, if you want to support someone, uh, you can, if an art, as an artist, if you want to like have community around a festival or, a, or an artist, you can. Um, so I think it's humanizing music again. I think not, not, I'm not anti-AI, but I think for, for music, um, it needs to be about hu humanity and people and how we connect. Uh, and I want to hear from tastemakers. So I, th I think I want to hear from you know people who have great taste, whether it's a kid in South Africa, whether it's a radio station, a DJ, a cool skateboarder. I want I want to discover and get into these different communities. So I think is that as the NFTs can power that ownership and those communities and the collectives um, and help those collectives kind of stand alone um, and be self-sustaining, I think that's the exciting part I love uh, that. for me. Love that. Andrew? We probably shouldn't have ended with me because mine's going to be a little dark. But um, <laughs> I feel this is a great place to end. The, the NFT that I dream of that I really want is one about legacy. So... Um, with decentralized storage right now, it's not truly decentralized. Uh, most times, you know, you're still on an S3 bucket or something, and, and the NFT just points to a file location. I think with decentralized storage, truly decentralized storage, you could build uh, sort of forever mausole mausoleums that contain NFT content of video, voice, written, and you can have like an entire private family um basically museum of everyone in your family speaking to future generations and 600 years from now 800 years from now people will not just hear in my own family my own personal take and what i think but like artists and uh, influencers and people who've like made fundamental change in society you could visit their mausoleum the same way that you do a museum 
um, but it's their words, their history, them uh, in like a very real way. And I think NFTs and decentralized uh, storage and and uh, you know components could could fuel that. And then you get AI to turn them into real avatars that you can speak to and still connect with when they're gone. Black Holy mirror, true. Gone. This is this is truly not what I thought you were going to say. If you'd have given me a million bucks, I wouldn't have guessed. Uh, I wouldn't have gone mausoleum. Um, but I absolutely love it. And uh, we, we are out of time for today. But also, if you head on to the All That Matters website, all of these uh, these fine chaps profiles are there. They're links to their links in, they're links to the website so you can connect later on. Um, so I just want to thank everyone up here for the time and thank you everyone for listening. <laughs>